Okay, so you made it to the second breakout session of day two of the symposium on disability cultural centers in higher education. I'm so pleased that you could join us tonight. Okay, so I want to welcome you all to um, session B2, which is about, it's called Envisioning a Culture of Accessibility on Campus. Um, and we're so thrilled to have the people that we do have with us tonight to talk about this. Um, but just to broadly uh, introduce the topic, this is gonna be a conversation um, where people will be sharing their thoughts and advice about the role that disability culture or DCC can play in shifting the overall culture of their institution toward greater accessibility. Um, so we have Julia Karpich on the call, who is a researcher in this area. And we also have um, Stephanie Dawson, Diane Wiener, and Aisha Razak. So it's a really great group. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to each of the lovely panelists that we have with us and they can introduce themselves and share their thoughts and experiences and advice on the, these questions. So do you wanna start us off, Julia? Sure, I'm happy to. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Julia Karpich. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm joining from Massachusetts, um, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Nipmuc people, that's N-I-P-M-U-C people. Um, I am a black mixed race woman, um, light brown skin and dark brown curly hair that's up in a bun. Um, I'm wearing a headset with a little microphone. It makes me look like I'm joining from a call center. Um, I'm excited to be with you all today. Um, a little bit about my background. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of California, Los Angeles or UCLA in their higher education program. So I study universities and change in universities. Um, my professional background is in disability services on the East Coast. So I worked in several urban and rural offices um, on the East Coast. So, my research is, um, looks at access practices um, in non-academic spaces, so spaces outside of the classroom and how staff um, think about the practice and kind of the meanings around access in their work. Um, and this came from my own experience kind of watching, or not watching, seeing a lot of access failures happen in non-academic spaces. So not that they don't also happen in the classroom, but I think there's a lot less structure um, once you step outside of the classroom in terms of how access happens. And so there were just, um, it was really difficult to both coordinate access in those spaces as someone kind of in a professional role. Um, and then for students, it was incredibly taxing. It's a lot of labor to be figuring out all of these different ways that each office on campus approaches access um, in ways that are very unstructured. So my research, um, I do a lot of talking with staff about how they've learned about access, what they think about access, how they do access in their spaces. Um, and a lot of the conversations that I have with staff, folks often talk about um, practice practices that don't actually require much of them. So the things that folks would commonly do are practices like coordinating CART um, or captioning, coordinating an ASL interpreter, referring somebody to disability services office. So having a contact for the disability services office. So these are all things that matter, right? They're not insignificant, they're important, um, but they also don't require staff in those offices to be directly engaged in a dynamic process of kind of being in relationship with disabled students and staff, folks. Um, and so where um, students would talk about a lot of access failures is those 
dynamic encounters with staff. So being in a space and just all of the little small gestures and access failures and the kind of lack of thought that was put into what it takes to truly create an accessible space. Um, and I think this is where um, disability cultural centers have such a, a powerful way that they can intervene and transform the campus culture because disability cultural centers are usually one of the only places on campus that are doing public programming that not only centers disability and talking about disability, but that centers access as a part of disability culture and really elevates and gives folks an opportunity to build community around disability, build relationships to disability, build relationships to access in new ways. And staff talked about that those staff who were on campuses with disability cultural centers talked about those spaces as being the place where they were learning to think about access in new ways. They were seeing models of access in ways that they had never seen before. And so that experiential component of um, cultural centers is, is huge. Um, I will just quickly, there were three um, quotes that were floating around in my mind this morning as I was thinking about this conversation. I just want to share those before um, I hand it over, hand the mic over. So one is a quote from a student who I spoke with as a part of my research who was reflecting on, disabled student who's reflecting on disability culture. Um, and she said, I think, quote, I think that one of the most beautiful parts of disability culture is the intimacy around not only learning how one's body and mind functions, but learning what you can do to respect and center that functioning. People don't realize that that is a culture and that that's a really beautiful culture. The other quote is from Cynthia, C-Y-N-T-H-I-A, um, Dillard, D-I-L-L-A-R-D, um, reflecting on community building, who wrote that, um, quote, being in community requires skill to see it and to create it. And so I thought about this in relation to disability cultural centers as these kind of amazing people, but the skill in seeing new ways of being in community and building community and then transferring those skills to help others create and replicate those ways of being with each other. Um, and kind of building community in new ways. And then the last one was um, uh, writing from Bell Hooks and her writing on porch sitting, this practice of porch sitting in Kentucky growing up um, and talking about how growing up with her siblings, if they were walking home and there, was, uh, there were neighbors sitting out on the porch and they didn't say hello, they didn't greet them. Um, that by the time they got home, word would have traveled to her mom um, and her mom would have, you know, sent them back out to walk back down the street to greet their neighbors. And so she, she wrote about that and said, um, you know, by the time we reached home, mama would have received a call about our failure to, to show courtesy and respect. She would make us take our walk again and perform the necessary ritual of speaking to our neighbors who were sitting on their porches. This small everyday gesture of porch sitting was linked to humanization. And so I was thinking about that in the context of, of access as kind of a, a repetitive praxis, this idea that these small gestures of access, those dynamic interpersonal um, being in spaces with people and being able to adjust, being able to connect with somebody, the things that staff don't usually do well, um, that those are humanizing. Those have the potential to be transformed into humanizing practices. When we do access well, when we model access, when we create spaces that center access, that that's a humanizing practice and is particularly humanizing in the context of campuses that routinely erase disabled um, and erase disabled communities. So I will pause here. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. 
I'm Stephanie Dawson and I use she, her pronouns. I'm an African-American woman. I identify as a disabled woman and I am sitting here in a black and white dress. My hair is pulled back in a ponytail and I am actually sitting in my kitchen. So it's a great space to be. We know that's the hub of most people's homes and that mine included. <laughs> um, and I am the director of the Miller Center for Student Disability Services at Miami University. And Miami University is located in Oxford, Ohio, within the traditional homelands of the Miami and Shawnee people, who along with other indigenous groups ceded these lands to the United States in the first Treaty of Greenville in 1795. The Miami people, whose name our university carries, were forcibly removed from these homelands in 1846. In 1972, a relationship between Miami University and the Miami tribe of Oklahoma began and evolved into a reciprocal partnership, including the creation of the Miami Center at Miami University in 2001. The work of the Miami Center serves the Miami tribe community and is dedicated to the revitalization of the Miami language and culture and to restoring that knowledge to the Miami people. Miami University and the Miami tribe are proud of this work and of the more than 140 Miami students who have attended Miami since 1991 through the Miami Heritage Award Program. And I think that is where I will also lead off with uh, one of the things that I think is critical in terms of um, developing um, a disability cultural center that is also sustainable. Um, so I am a practitioner. Um, I um, have clinical training, um, master of social work is my background. So I really sort of came into disability services um, during my graduate work. And I did graduate um, work in disability services for half of my placement, but then I also did more clinical work and just fell in love with disability services. And um, here we are Oh gosh, I don't know, good 15, 16 years later. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I have served in various capacities, um, but then also have had the great opportunity of being at Miami and really seeing this evolution of uh, us developing a disability cultural center and being in a very different place than when I began my career at the institution. And so one of the things that I think is really important, obviously, Julia, I really liked how you emphasize the relational component, but that is also critical in order to establish a disability cultural center. And so it's really about um, making it clear. First, I think it was really important for us to demystify accessibility and demystify disability. And that was just years and years of work because we, you know, really had a culture of people feeling that one office owned accessibility and disability, but not only that, it wasn't a matter of people uh, trying to shirk responsibility, right? You're always going to have twinges of that, but it was also a matter of people simply being fearful or not knowing how to engage, right, um, with these human matters. And so that is super important. I think that is really where you start and getting people to really be in a comfort zone to engage with accessibility, to engage with disability, to think about their own identity um, and allowing really um, opportunities for ideas to develop and for people to really have the freedom to move with their ideas, no matter how large or how small. Because I think what happens as you're trying to build a disability cultural center is as you start to demystify disability and accessibility and have people really start to feel more comfortable, think about um, their own identities, think about how they can make their areas more accessible, think about how they can start to partner with disability services um, and really, you know, become champions, become allies become partners, what naturally happens in that process is new ideas are created.
and people will want to start a new project or start a new initiative. And that is actually where some of our greatest um, disability cultural center efforts occur, right? That's when we bring in some of our best speakers. That's when we bring in some of our best programming. That's when our students get fiery and passionate and send 50 emails, right, about a pro project, you know, and emailing at 2 a.m. in the morning. But it, that's really critical is for once people start feeling comfortable and things are demystified, being sure that the system and the structure and the bureaucracy doesn't tamp really good creative ideas that can get all of the programming and initiatives and cultural center ha happenings going. And the more that you can really invite that vibrant energy and that creativity, then that's where people really start to become champions because they're engaged, right? They're seeing their ideas come to life. So those would be some things that I think are important. Um, another thing that we've started to think a lot more about also is we did play, we have placed a lot of emphasis on our physical space, um, but we're also trying to look at how is our digital space mirroring these things that we wanted to do in our physical space? And I think sometimes it can be easy. You know, we have the history of being located on the outskirts of campus in the basement at Miami, and now we're in a much, you know, more central location. There were a variety of things that led to that move, um, and it's been beneficial. But sometimes you may be in an office where you're still on the outskirts of campus in the basement. But thinking about are there efforts that can still take place in digital spaces, right? And so that could be social media accounts. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, different tips that we do. We also celebrate other cultural months as well, right, on our social media. Um, and we will have certain topics and a very clear plan where we really make sure that we're bringing in that cultural thread, right, to our social media content in addition, uh, you know, to some practical things that students may need. But I think also really thinking about both digital and physical spaces is something that um, is really critical. And then the other piece that is important is to recognize that, um, for instance, at Miami, we have a lot of people that are just interested in our, in our cultural center work, and we have a good relationship with our disability studies colleagues, right? And we have really active students. But that interest it may be uneven at certain parts of the institution, okay? So for example, we have some faculty champions that are very interested in what we're doing, but the faculty and staff, that's one area where we still need to move the needle a little bit on faculty really understanding the evolution of now we are a cultural center and what that really means. Because the majority of faculty really engage with us more for the practical matter of right ensuring accommodations than classroom accommodations. But we really have to still say we've had so many wins that are giving us momentum to address some of these other uneven areas like around our faculty staff really understanding how we've evolved as a center. And you really have to be comfortable with that. And then the gains that you've made in those other areas, try to figure out how you can capitalize on those, right, to address um, some of the areas of campus that may need a little help understanding the new vision, the new mission, the new direction. So those are just a few things that, like, <laughs> um, strings of consciousness I want to share around DCCC, and I will pass it to the next speaker. Thank you so much, everyone. It's really an honor to be here. Um, and I will give a brief introduction and then give some, um, share some thoughts as well. So um, good evening. I guess it's evening already. Is it evening in Chicago? I guess so. Um, it's evening in New York, um, at, least, um, at least from my perspective. So I'm honored and thrilled to be here. Thank you for including me. 
I apologize for those of you who have heard me or accessed otherwise this description. I'm going to repeat in the spirit of accessibility. Um, and I want to thank Margaret and Javin and everyone involved in making this space possible uh, today. Um, I'm Diane Weiner, and I have something I'm going to read here for the sake of uh, access for my own acuity. So I'm, I'm going to move my gaze in a multiplicity of directions momentarily. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. But Diane is really the best way to address me, or hey, you, also works if it's done with affection. I'm a genderqueer, middle-aged, white Ashkenazi Jew. I'm neuroqueer. I identify as mad and as crip. And I have salt and pepper, buzz cut hair situation. I'm wearing green framed glasses and a black t-shirt from Live On which is um, an activist initiative that has to do with disability awareness, disability pride, and the importance of disabled people's lives and why they are worth living for us. Um, I think that it's important for me to add that I'm wearing a necklace with a dragonfly that honors my beloved Ann Joan, one of my heroes. And I'm joining you today in respectful, accountable, and shared stewardship. I live on the unceded lands of the Cayuga and Onondaga nations in Awaga, sometimes called Owego, New York. I'm seated in front of a maroon wall with brightly colored artwork behind me from all over the place, most of it made by people I know personally, including friends in my circle, as well as family members. And from 2011 to 2018, I served as the founding director of Syracuse University's Disability Cultural Center. And I am currently continuing in my role as the lead editor of Word Gathering, which is a journal of disability culture and the arts. It's actually called Word Gathering, a journal of disability poetry and literature, but it's much more interdisciplinary than just two sets of genres. So that's that. And I think it's important for me to reflect very much on my gratitude for being in this digital space with you. And like some of the comments shared by my colleagues already, I um, echo not just auditorily a commitment to intersectionality and to collaboration. And in the chat, I'm going to put two links of potential interest. You may know about both of these texts, but these are open access copies of J. Timothy Dolmage's Academic Ableism and Sasha Costanza Chalk's wonderful book called Design Justice, uh, which is about community-led practices. And I think while I remain um, connected with the values and vicissitudes of universal design for instruction, universal design for learning, universal design broadly. I think it's important to think about design justice in relationship with, uh, excuse me, universal design, because design justice takes as a premise an intersectional commitment and also takes as a premise when thinking about envisioning a culture of accessibility on campus and beyond, the centering of the lived experience and expertise of disabled people and other marginalized people who hail from an array of backgrounds and hold all kinds of identity axes. So the book that Sasha Costanza Chak wrote about this in this uh, format I'm sharing here really gets at that and the importance of not just bashing and critiquing universal design as some people do, which is their prerogative and I get some of that and why, really trying to think about what to do now because universal design is often what winds up being the conversation, but I think that it needs to go further. Um, I'm very grateful for having had the opportunity to work closely with an ADA 503-504 coordinator um, in the person of Scott Listener at Ohio State, the Ohio State University. And um, there were squirrels scurrying outside who came to say hello. So I'm not sure if that was um, accessible to all of you, but the cats will respond here in, in kind. And also 
at the SU campus where I was employed full time until literally a few weeks ago, and now I'm continuing in my role as the journal editor, I worked closely with William Myhill, who is an ADA 503-504 coordinator. And one of the interesting things about envisioning a culture of accessibility on campus, and I'll say this again, knowing this is being recorded complexly, I'll say they asked uh, to create um, a position in human resources for a disability cultural center director before they had an ADA 503, 504 coordinator. And so what often happened is that I, in my role as the founding director, you probably know where I'm going with this, was asked to uh, address all manner of physical, digital, and interpersonal accessibility questions across the entire campus while trying to be the director of a largely understaffed um, context that was brand new in higher ed. So I say that without being negative, but just to be candid and transparent. And so having uh, the opportunity to reflect on this all these years later, almost 11 years later, amazingly, I think it would have been good to have hired an ADA 503, 504 coordinator before hiring a director of a disability cultural center so that their collaborative relationship could have been established a little bit differently. Happily, the uh, leadership and team of the Disability Resources Center at Syracuse University is very uh, clued in when it comes to the complexities of intersectionality and the distinction between disability justice work and disability rights work. And so I appreciate that. I appreciate their um, commitments and orientation in that regard. And so collaborating with those folks was really an honor and remains a privilege of mine in friendship since I'm no longer in the role. Um, I think another example I wanted to share briefly is thinking about the numbers of ways in which I've had people talk with me over the years informally about every single person they know who's disabled, right? And so one of the things that happens is that people say, oh, Diane's coming. Don't say crazy. Diane's here. Diane will get offended. And then I say, well, this isn't really about me being offended. It's about the complexity of language. And then someone will say, well, you know, I was at the bus the other day and I noticed that the way that folks were getting off the bus was problematic because the lift wasn't working. And I was wondering what you would have done about that. Or someone tells me about their cat or their cousin or their cat's cousin, or I'm not really kidding actually, right? Or their mother or themselves or their child or their young adult about to be college student, um, you know, sibling. And I found this extremely complex and meaningful because over the years, I got to meet people who came in a way to communicate with me that really was because very few people were willing to have conversations with them anywhere else. And it was in some ways an, um, alarming, but it was also an honor. And again, I see this without ego or hubris or, or any other troubling egocentrism. I say it with um, humility. And I know a lot of people who now are able to know each other because they met each other informally with my um, hopeful suggestion. And they started to create more and more sense of community that exists well past my time in this role. And so now I have people write to me from all over the unceded land, sometimes called the United States, lowercase u, lowercase s. And I've had people write to me and interact with me from all over the planet saying, I met someone, I mean, it's sort of funny, like, do you know so-and-so is part of it. And of course, I don't know every single, I'm laughing, right? I don't know every single disabled person. I don't know every single neurodivergent person. I certainly don't know every single Spoonie or person who's who's uh, chronically ill or identifies as sick or mad or any number of other complex identities. I don't know every single deaf person who could possibly know all those people, but I do know a few of, pe of those folks from all of these different interacting communities and people have met each other. And so one of the ways to envision a culture of accessibility is to endlessly talk about accessibility and to be a pain in the ass and to simultaneously encourage people to meet each other with permission. 
So I remember when we invited Jay Dolmage to campus. And at the time, I was a co-chair for a council on diversity and inclusion, which was later renamed uh, around, um, you know, the commitment, to, I'll say kindly, uh, to center not just diversity and inclusion, but equity, accessibility, and belonging. And so there's a kind of um, nuanced situation that unfolded where in that role, I was able to interact directly with the chancellor. And so the chancellor and their executive leadership team were encouraged very strongly by myself and my co-chair, Barry L. Wells, to meet with Jay. And they were required by the chancellor to read academic ableism. Yeah, I see some of you responding uh, and I'm aware of a visuality there for my own accessibility here. But I think that there are Lots of facial expressions that accompany that having occurred, and I'm glad it occurred. And I think there were ways in which centering the wisdom and expertise and experience of disabled students was something more likely to happen because of the chancellor's approach to this. So I can tell more stories about that, but in the interest of time, I will pause and just add that I think one of the ways to envision a culture of accessibility is to make good trouble, to quote Mr. Lewis, and I think to engage in every single conceivable conversation without feeling exploited in doing it. And so I think if someone wants to talk to me about something I don't even really know a lot about, which is like how the bus stop is set up, I'm still interested in having the conversation. And if someone wants to talk to me about paradigms of building management and frameworks for setting up tactile flooring in a new building, I'm down. I'm happy to have that conversation, but I'll also suggest people who have more direct experience who should also be part of that conversation. And if someone wants to talk about, you know, what's wrong with having a backdoor and a digital interface because it's no better than having a backdoor secondary entrance for people in a physical landscape. It's just parallel to that. Let's have that conversation. So those are some of my reflections. And um, thanks very much for the opportunity to be with you. All right. Um Hi everyone, uh, my name is Aisha. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, it's great to be here and also uh, Eid Mubarak for those who are observing. Um, I was the former president of the Disabled Student Cultural Center at the University of Minnesota. And now I graduated and still kind of stick around as an advisor. I identify as disabled, um, specifically autistic and ADHD, so not visibly disabled. Uh, I'm calling from Minnesota, which is uh, the land of the Ojibwe, Sioux, and Dakota nations. Uh, I am a 22-year-old mixed East and South Asian woman. I have uh, black glasses, longer black hair, I'm wearing a, a traditional Bengali sour kameez, which is uh, a dress with a scarf that has a bunch of uh, red, pink, and gold intricate flower embroidery. And I also have um, a pair of AirPods on. Uh, behind me is a white wall with a family picture of me and my siblings when we were younger, and then a window with uh, yellow curtains and blue beads hanging off of it. Um, so I guess when it comes to envisioning a culture of accessibility, uh, am I, I am gonna acknowledge that um, among uh, all the speakers here, I am probably the youngest one. And uh, I am coming from a perspective of the language around uh, disability and mental health changing as I grew up. I grew up watching the way people 
spoke and the standards people held uh, change. I remember um, when I was in elementary school, we had a whole seminar on why people shouldn't be using the R word. And then in high school, um, I had similar ones about words such as uh, crazy um, and the stigmas around mental illness. Um, um, I think an important um, principle that people should keep in mind when envisioning and creating a culture of um, access in their local community is paying close attention to um, the local issues rather than just the broad disability justice landscape because no two places are the same. Uh, every place is gonna have uh, unique um, barriers and unique issues that they have to deal with. I, one example I can think of is in Minnesota, uh, we have um, much higher rates of uh, mental illness and we have a mental health problem uh, overall that uh, still is largely going unaddressed, especially among high school and college age students. Um, and a good chunk of people coming into our space have, have had experiences with um, mental health problems. And um, it's, it, it's very common for the DSCC to also uh, work in that realm. We have events and and um, sorry to interrupt. I, resources, uh, mental health, or affiliate tackle, such as. Um, um, we are just losing your audio a little bit. The last thing that we got, though, um, was you were talking about the SCC intervening in some of these um, <clears throat> mental health areas. You know, you were just talking about how there's a high incidence of mental health um, concerns with high school and college age students. So do you mind just kind of picking up where that ended? Yeah, um, so the DSCC is often closely tied not just to disability, but to mental health at the U of M because um, it's a prevalent problem, especially in the community that we're in. Um, that's uh, sort of one example of how local issues play a role in how we operate as a group. Um, another more humorous one from uh, before the pandemic was we had an issue of people leaving Lime scooters all over the place. Those, um, uh, you know, those electric scooters that they rent, they were leaving them all over the sidewalk and there were um, trip hazards, especially um, for those with wheelchairs or visual impairments. Um, and I think that leads into a point of um, the conversation around uh, access and accessibility doesn't always have to be a serious, in-depth discussion in order to reach people. Um, basically, we went around making memes about it, um, uh, just using different sort of meme formats to get the message out there that people need to put the Lime scooters away properly. Um, and uh, yeah, just approaching it with um, good humor and remembering that even though uh, this is a serious issue and we need to take um, it, the culture of access and increasing access seriously, there is, um, there is some, there is wiggle room. Uh, there's plenty of room to still find humor and find enjoyment in it. Um, and I think another big thing that shifted our culture of accessibility was the pandemic when um, everyone was going remote um, and suddenly um, work-life balance, mental health, um, accommodations, all of these became hot button issues, not just for the disabled community, um, but 
uh, everyone was looking for ways that they can gain access, whether in school or in work or elsewhere. Um, and that kind of provided in, in, in terms of uh, having that conversation um, when people who aren't disabled were experiencing these accessibility barriers for the first time, it allowed us to um, it allowed us to have these conversations because now it's coming from a place of empathy, understanding, and experience um, rather than access being just this big theoretical concept that um, seemed far off for many. Um, and I think when it comes to shifting the overall culture within an institution, definitely um, pushing for accommodations and being stubborn plays a huge role. Um, it, at the U of M, uh, professors are often encouraged to follow people's accommodation requests, but many of them are denied because under the pretense that they fundamentally change the core curriculum or uh, the core goals of a course. And there really is no criteria for how, for when accommodations can be denied or what alternatives can be offered. A, any professor can deny any accommodation by saying it um, doesn't align with the class's objectives, but it they don't really talk about the specifics of it. Like they don't say specifically why. So just being stubborn about it, taking it to higher levels like um, the Disability Resource Center or to other administrative bodies um, just shows that we're not gonna budge um, and that uh, our accommodations and having access to um, our accommodations is not optional. Um, it sends the message that um, access is required. Access should be an expectation rather than a favor. Um, and yeah, I know we only have like 10 minutes left and people probably have questions. So I'm just gonna put a cork in it right there. Thank you, Aisha. You, you were dropping a lot of truth bomb there um, to lead us into the Q&A. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts. Um, so I'm gonna open the chat and I wanna invite folks in the room to um, let us know your thoughts, let us know your questions. You can ask something in the chat and I'll read it out. Or if you want to use the raise hand feature, I can call on you. And usually takes people a little moment to gather their thoughts. So if anybody on the panel is ruminating on anything, go for it. This is Diane. I'll just briefly say that I do feel ruminative. Um, I'm chewing my cud, but I, I also want to say just really briefly that I really think this conference is historic. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to say that, um, you know, that way, because I feel like it's going to have ripple effects for many, many years to come, and that all of this content is now archived. And I'm grateful to you, uh, Margaret and Javin and everyone who's made this possible for all of that and for so much more. This is Margaret. Um, thank you, Diane. It it was, I think I've mentioned this in another session, but this was a pretty selfish dream. But I, I also understood that I think the things I'm craving are things other people are craving too. Um, and yeah, I've been so delighted with just what everyone's been contributing and sharing. Um, so I want to 
something just came in the chat. So Owen R has, oh, sorry, it was a direct message, but it was a question about whether sharing out some resources would be appropriate. And I think it would be absolutely appropriate. So um, Owen, if you can figure it out um, and would like to send this out to everyone, please feel in, empowered to do that. And if you can't figure it out, I will do that at some point, but I've noticed that cutting and pasting in the chat is a little tricky for me. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And we've got some agreements coming into the, into the chat um, with Diane's comment about how this has been a really meaningful um, gathering that hopefully will have ripple effect. Um, and then Emily has a question that I'd like to read out. From a student perspective, what can we do to foster accessibility and accountability on campus? That's a great question, Emily. So I'll comment on this. We have students who do action projects pretty regularly, which are part of their Intro to Disability Studies course. But I think that model, whether it's in a structured course, you know, or it's more informal, is is important. So if you see an access issue in your campus environment as a student, I think the first thing that you can do, you know, is to recognize that you are empowered and see yourself as a stakeholder in the environment. You do have to be realistic as a student that you may see a problem and have an idea of one solution, right, that will work, but there could be a lot of complexities that may lead to that solution being realized or not. So you definitely want to go into it with vigor and passion, but understand, right, that there are a number of factors um, that may play into problem solving and that there are also a number of solutions, right, to different problems. And so um, I would say be energetic, feel empowered, but there is can be strength when you mobilize with other students. Um, so be open to um, talking about what you are noticing in your environment with other students. Uh, be open to doing that with students who aren't in your same academic department or discipline, because a lot of times that diversity and thought when you're working with students in other programs may lead to some um, other creative solutions. And I think it's always important to find that one stakeholder in the university that you can go to to say, hey, we recognize this problem, we're concerned, we wanna talk about problem solving, or we wanna put forth a solution, but always give that person the opportunity to, um, connect you with other people. And I think sometimes the students, it, it's easy, like, you know, I, I mean, I've been a student, right, many times, you reach out to someone with the expectation that they're going to be the keeper of that information, but just always kind of go to them and say, hey, if you're not the right person that can help me with this, can you give me the names of at least two or three people that I should talk to? This is Julia. Um, I would, to building on Stephanie's comment, kind of around reaching out to other students and other spaces on campus, I think um, thinking about student organizing and student organizations is a powerful part of this conversation and reflecting on the remote access now um, sit in at UCLA that happened um, the spring and fall and the organizing that went into that, and just how the disabled student union at UCLA was able to. Um, build solidarity with other student unions on campus, the Black Student Union on campus, um, to put forward to the university kind of this, uh, a, um, a strategic list of requirements for what it would mean to create an accessible campus. And the solidarity that they had across student organizations made that protest extremely powerful um, and really beautiful. And so I think both thinking about um, organizing within student organizations and thinking about accessibility within student organizations and the, the agency that you might have to make change there. Like what are the spaces that you're informally creating as students and how could those spaces be more accessible? But then also thinking about 
um, mobilizing um, and the power of student mobilizing and, and doing that um, and how that can be transformative of the culture of accessibility on campus. Uh, this is Aisha. Um, kind of going off of that, even outside of outside of formally uh, mobilizing or outside of the student group space, social pressure is actually a really great tool. And by that, I mean holding each other accountable outside of the space, whether it is your peers or your professors or people in the community. Um, what I, something that I encourage people to use is that we have more technological capabilities and more avenues of communication than ever before. And we can seriously use that to our advantage. Um, I remembered having a particular professor who um, denied a lot of accommodations and was overall quite ableist. Um, in the, especially when he was teaching a psychology class, a lot of the content was heavily skewed um, towards uh, sort of uh, older, outdated, ableist information. And uh, one um, really impressive thing I saw after the semester was people taking to places like Rate My Professor and giving their honest opinion and actually talking candidly about their experiences rather than um, sort of keeping it a secret or um, anything like that. Um, so sometimes like I understand that, um, you know, we want to be uh, civil and we want, um, we want to um, have a welcoming image, but at the same time, especially when you are dealing with um, injustices from sort of higher authorities or um, people who have any sort of power over you, um, you need to understand that um, niceness isn't always everything. You have to, like I said before, you have to um, be stubborn and you have to push uh, for them to either, um, you have to either push for um, ret retribution or push for accountability and push them to change, um, even if it's not something that they would be comfortable with, especially professors. Like a lot of them are not comfortable with uh, implementing certain accommodations, but they're comfort uh, does not take place over our right to have um, our right to have equitable access in the classroom and in the academic setting. Oh, I see that yes from Julia. Um, I echo that sentiment. And unfortunately we are at time. Uh, so there have been a few more great questions coming in, but um, if you do still have the spoon, the energy, um, we will be having our final session of the symposium in one hour. You should probably double check the schedule because I've lost my sense of time, but I believe it's in one hour um, in the main Zoom room. And that is gonna be kind of a, an experimental thing where we're just gonna try to open it up to everyone in as orderly, a manner as possible to continue with some of these conversations. Um, so please just join me in thanking everyone for everything. Thank you to people who joined us in the audience. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing your thoughts. Um, and thank you to the access workers. <laughs>